In a minute, we're going to be in John chapter 8. I invite you to find that passage while we're talking. One of the exciting things about today is to look out here and see how many people I do not know, which is wonderful. What more do you want for a church where you serve than for it continue to be growing, to have ministry, to attract and to reach people for the cause of the gospel? If I don't know you, I'm so glad you're here. You'll learn better. But thank you for coming today. It is a privilege to be with you, to be in this pulpit. I continue to admire what you do. I continue to say to my colleagues, if you get the chance to go there, you need to go. The bishop ever whispers in your ear that it might be a possibility you tell him yes, because it's a great church and you're wonderful people. But we've come to hear what the Lord has to say to us today, and so I do want to turn to that. I am appreciative of the extra time. We'll be out by 12, and uh, I'm glad y'all have arranged these services this way. We have just one line out of a much larger story. And the first part of the line, you're going to know. You're going to be able to quote with me, but maybe not the last part. It's one of the I am sayings. There are seven of them in John, and we get focused on the I am part, where Jesus is trying to tell us something about himself, about his nature, about what it means to be the incarnate Word of God. But hear this word from the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, the 12th verse. And again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. My brothers and my sisters, the Word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. I don't really remember when light became an issue for me. I was young once, and I could see. We'd move into a parsonage. I'd get all them 40-watt bulbs out, put 100-watt bulbs in. Let's brighten this place up, you know. I could drive at night. It's no problem. What are y'all talking about? And then things happen. I get up in the morning now, black socks, navy blue socks. I don't know. Go in the bathroom, turn on the light. I still don't know. I had to go stand by the window to be able to tell. You know what I mean? When did light become an issue? I put night lights all over my house now. I, st I even bought those little, um, I don't get uh, commissions for this, but I even bought those little flash plates that go over your outlet that have little lights in the bottom. Those are way cool. You should get them. They really, they work well. I still drive at night, but I now know the answer to the song, I wear my sunglasses at night. It's to cut the glare. I know why. There's not a 100-watt bulb in my house anywhere. It's like automatic admission to geezerhood when light becomes an issue. You know what I mean? All the geezers out there. Yeah, you know. You know. So when I hear this passage, my mind goes places it didn't used to go. Maybe it's proof that senility is always closer than we think. But my mind just... I think about things that I never thought about before. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And I think about SAD, seasonal affective disorder. Y'all know about this? People who don't get enough sunlight in the winter have physical issues. What happens to me when the light of the world doesn't shine in my life? I think about sunshine, the great disinfectant, works on your clothes, works on your politicians, cleans everything up, just let that light shine everywhere. What would the light of the world clean up in me? I think about, I think about how overwhelming it is now to just go buy a light bulb. Have you had to buy a light bulb? You go stand in the aisle at Lowe's. I want a light. I have to take the old bulb with me now, and I still can't find it. Do I want an LED bulb? Do I want a CFL bulb? You know, did the government make these acronyms up? Do I want a halogen bulb? Do I want a 4100K cool white bulb? Or do I want one of those blue 
crystals that's supposed to make everything look better, or maybe I want a day light bulb. What is that, 6100K? You know, I just wanted a light bulb. I didn't need a PhD in illumination. I just wanted a light bulb. It's overwhelming. How overwhelming is it to think that Jesus wants to shine His light all in my life? Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and my mind just goes places. It goes places it didn't used to go. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, notice what he says not say. Jesus does not say, I am a light. He does not say, I am one of the lights. He says, I am the light, as in the only light, as in there ain't no more but me, which is South Georgia for I am the light. This is not you light up my life, some kind of warm, you bring me joy, you make me happy, I'll feel good. You don't just stand up in the middle of a crowd to say, hey, I make people feel good. They'll get the message if you do. This isn't the Beatitudes. You are the light of the world. Oh, we like the Beatitudes because they tell us what to do and we like it when it's clear what to do. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. This isn't about us at all. This is about Jesus. I am the light of the world. When Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, what he means is, without me, you're in the dark. Without me, the world is dark. I don't mean without me, the world is dim. I don't mean it's brighter over by me and it's dimmer over there. I mean, there's light and there's dark. And there is no in-between. That's not how we think. But that's what he says. Let me give a little historical context. I knew Robert Bennett would be here today, so I wanted to have a little history lesson as part of the sermon. <laughs> Jesus is in Jerusalem, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, at the Feast of Tabernacles, part of what they're celebrating is that he led them out of Egypt with a mighty hand with wonders. You remember with a pillar of cloud by day and what? A pillar of fire by night. If you go to Jerusalem, it talks about Mount Zion. The temple, it really is. It's up on the top of the mountain. And the rest of the city is built on the sides of the mountain. And if you stand in the city, it's a little bit harder now because they have high-rise buildings now. They didn't have high-rise buildings in Jesus' day. And you can stand down in, in the city about anywhere and look up and see the temple. He's in the courtyard of the Gentiles, the courtyard where the women are allowed to go, the courtyard where everybody is. He's not in the, the secluded parts where only some people go. He's out there where everybody is. If you've been to Williamsburg, you've seen the, uh, the, the night lights, the street lights they used to have in those days. They're basically big bowls that you build a fire in. Well, they would have these during the Feast of Tabernacles where they would build these huge, high bonfires to celebrate that he led them out of Egypt with a pillar of fire. And everybody knew that they were remembering the light of God that saved the children of Israel. Now, when you stand up next to the light that is a symbol of the power of God, right in the middle of the temple, on the top of the hill, and you say, I am the light of the world? Well, we have a term for that. It's called bodacious. Jesus is many things, friends, but he never was a wimp. He'd just stand up and say it. The moral of God's light, the presence of God's light, the remembrance of of God's power to save, the presence of God's power to save, the proof that God was with us, God with us. I am the light of the world. It's not the first time God has said this. It's not the first time God has talked about Israel being a light. It's not the first time God has talked about Israel being a light to the world. I was in Sunday school this morning. 
Michael talked about this same message where God said many, many, many times, I'll quote just a couple uh, out of Isaiah 42, I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I've taken you by the hand and kept you. I've given you as a covenant to the people and a light to the nations. Notice, I didn't give you to be a light to yourselves, but a light to the nations. Later on in Isaiah, it's, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the survivors of Israel. That's too little a thing. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. They got it wrong. They got it wrong. Not just a light to raise up the tribe of Jacob, though the tribes of Jacob are included. Not just a light to raise up the survivors of Israel, though the survivors of Israel are included, but a light to the salvation of the world. Back in the Old Testament, back in the exile, back during the restoration, God was saying to them, it's not about you. It's not just about you. It's about the salvation of the whole world. The church needs to hear this because God says the same thing to us today. It's not about you, but about the world out there. The Bible says God so loved the what? That he sent his son. Israel decided that God loved Israel. And that if you're going to be one of God's children, you had to become an Israelite. And they just sort of got stuck in there, which is why Jesus stands on Mount, uh, the Mount of Golgotha outside of Jerusalem and looks at the city and weeps. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Now I tell you, destruction will come upon you. Christians, Christians really have to consider what does this mean for our support of Israel now? It's a very complicated question. I know there's a whole group of folks that, that want to say a different thing than what I think the Scripture says. But God's made it very clear. Israel was never about Israel. It's about the salvation of the world from the beginning to the end. In fact, we face a very difficult decision. Did you know that the only Christians in Israel are not Israelis? They're Palestinians. The Israelis are Jewish. The Palestinians are the Christians. It's a complicated issue. And it's not the important issue this morning. It's not the thrust of our message. Jesus says to them, I am the light of the world, but it doesn't stop then. And so often that's as far as we get. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the scary part of it right there. That's the scary part of it right there. If I follow the light, it's going to shine. And when it shines, it's going to shine. If I follow the light, I'm in the light. If I don't follow the light, I'm in the dark. And being in the light is not always comfortable, is it? How many of y'all have stage fright? Just the notion that I would get up there and they would put that light on me is terrifying because they all look at me. By the way, if you agree with Tina or if you disagree with Tina about the mic, write a note on a $50 bill and hand it to the sound guy. $50 enough? Yeah, he'll pay careful attention. You know how painful it is to turn on the light at night when you've been asleep and your eyes hurt? The problem with shining the light is it shines on everything. And I don't want it to shine on everything. The problem with the light shining is it shines right on me. And there I am, exposed. And it's just not comfortable because I've lived with me all my life. I know what I'm like. The one person you can't keep lying to is yourself. We try. 
We try. But somewhere in there, we always know the truth, don't we? The life's not always comfortable. Walking in the light, living in the light, being in the light can be tough. Because as the truth comes out, we see things for what they really are. And the truth does tend to come out. But you got to think of the options here. I can walk in the light or what? Oh, what we think is, I want to walk near the light. I want to be on the edge of the light. I want to be in that little dim, shadowy place where it's not really dark, but, you know, it's not bright light either. I just want to be right in there. I want to be a helper on the committee. I don't want to be the chair. Yeah. But Jesus doesn't know anything about this grayness, this dim area, this dusk. Jesus knows two things. You walk in the light or you walk in the dark. In fact, he really only knows one thing. You walk in the light or you don't. Because anything other than walking in the light is walking in the dark. Anything else. I'm telling you, that Jesus will just say it. And some days you wish he'd quit. Because he's tough. Jesus' comment created quite a stir at the temple, not because they didn't understand him, but because they did. They knew exactly what he was saying and they didn't like it. You either follow me and you walk in the light or you walk in the darkness. And if you follow me, there is no dark. Well, I don't like that. Jesus says, so... Did I ask you? Paul says it like this later on. Once you were in darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. You hear that contrast? Earlier in John, we hear it like this. In Him was life, and that light was the light of all people. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness what? has never overcome it. Get that. The darkness has never overcome it. Who wins in the end? In another book, John's talking about what it's going to be like in that day of rejoicing. And here's what he says. And there will be no more night when we get in that land of the wonderful day. There will be no more night they will need no light of sun or lamp, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. No more night, no more dark, for the Lord God will be their light. In the world that is to come, and in the world that is, I am the light of the world. And if I don't walk in the light now, how comfortable would I be then? And hear me clearly, we're not talking about dabbling in church. There's nothing in here about being in church. It's all about being in Jesus and Jesus being in us. God never gets confused about that. We get confused about that because we will always settle for the easiest thing for us to do. And being in church is a whole lot easier than being in Jesus. But God's very clear. Walk in me. Walk in the light. Oh, it's going to hurt for a while. It's not going to be pleasant for a while, but we'll clean all that up. And then, and then. And I'm so scared about getting clean up and what somebody might say. that I give up the light for the dark. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, the temptation is to hear this as a proclamation <clears throat> that tells me something about who Jesus is, and it is that. But we miss the point if we don't read the rest of the sentence because he said, I am the light of the world so that he could say the next thing. 
The important part of this is not the declaration about Jesus. He's just telling us what truth is there. He's simply describing reality. That's like going outside and saying the sun is blue, the sun is, is yellow, the sky is blue, the air is cold or wet or whatever it is. It's just reality. The important part is the next thing. Whoever walks in me, whoever follows me, whoever comes with me, it's the invitation that's the important part. Jesus is telling you about reality, but He's offering you a new reality for you. I'm the light of the world, but let me tell you about you. You might be in the darkness now, but you don't have to stay there. That darkness might be in you now, but I can drive that darkness out. Listen, I'm good at cleaning things up. Let me introduce you to this lady over here who had the seven demons. Let me introduce you to this man over here who was troubled and distressed by his sins. Let me introduce you to Zacchaeus. That man was a skunk and a thief. Let me introduce you to, again and again, I can clean him up. I'm good at that. And I have no problem cleaning you up. There's nothing in you, says Jesus. There's nothing in you I'm scared to see. And there shouldn't be anything in me that you're scared to see, says Jesus. Come take a look. I'm the light of the world. But if you walk in me, if you walk out of the dark and just head toward the light, <clears throat> if you walk in me, you will never walk in the darkness at all. You will have the light of what? The light of life. This is the same Jesus that said, I have come to give them life and to give it how? Abundantly. I don't give a little life. I don't tweak your life to make your problems a little less aggravating. I don't massage things a little bit. I transform things. Behold, I make all things new. <laughs> I'm not into tweaking. You go to the gym for tweaking. You come to me, you'll get a new body. You come to me, you'll get a new mind. Oh, you come to me, you'll get a new heart. You want to be dark? You want to be light. I want to look at the light. I want to be close to the light. But I just want to do what I want to do and run my own life. That's the issue, isn't it? Jesus, can I have your light in me and still call the shots for my own life? And he says, no. 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 But I'm telling you this, you think you want to call the shots because that'll make you happy. How's it working out so far? You come on and walk in the light. And you will find what joy and grace and peace really are. So I want to extend that invitation today. I remember when I first walked in this sanctuary a long time ago. I walked in in the late afternoon and I thought, this is one dark building. <laughs> they didn't have any lights on then. I just walked in, you know. It took a while. It took a while. But the amazing thing is, after I'd been here a year, I never thought of it as a dark building. Did the building change? Not a bit. You will get comfortable living in the shadows, and they won't bother you until you get in some place where there's real light, and you'll say, I have been missing out. I want to say to you today, 
the light of the world invites you to come to him. And I don't care how comfortable you are in the shadows. It's going to be better in the light. It's going to be better in the light. You're going to be better in the light. Would you pray with me?